All right, welcome back. Oh my God, to Anime Savants. Oh, so much. Um, <laughs> I, I am Sophie this week. Nice, nice. I am uh, Vash the Stampede. Okay. Um, and so let's just get into the thing that 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 just happened. Um, that needs to be talked about. Like immediately. <laughs> so we got the ending to Witch from Mercury, and it was everything and so much more of what I wanted. It was amazing. It was it was the deliverance on what they gave us in the prologue. It was the 100%, deliverance. 100%. It was the deliverance. And it was so worth it. Like, I think I saw someone say, Oh, they spent this whole season building up these characters getting us to relate and you know knowing how people feel about this this and that and then they just they just ripped the band-aid off and was like Nigga, get get your ass get but your they, ass but they told out. you this yeah. was gonna happen well they, i'm saying a lot of people us. who this is their first gundam and they're like oh my god i didn't know this got down like that while i'm like i'm waiting like i'm waiting for the ball to drop it's going to happen. And did it drop on someone's head? Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Sorry. Sorry about wow. that. <laughs> wow. So what, what, what did you think about it? Uh, aside from them slow rolling at least one more reveal that we're probably not getting, you know, God knows for how long. Uh, I thought this they got a lot done. In the final episode, because there were all these story threads that were hanging out there, and I wasn't 100% certain how they were going to, like, resolve them. So, not we'll get to them as we talk through the episode, but the threads in question were Suleta, Miarine being split apart. How was, they, they did it physically, and then they did it sort of emotionally and whatever at the end of the end of the episode. The resolution of the attack on the plant... Um, Prospera's plan for uh, Suleta, which again, they've not... I thought they were going to get a little deeper into what that was, nope. but they didn't. Um, Gel and his dad, um, Miorine's father, the assassination attempt, how is that going to turn out? Everything to do with the Earth Witches and this new rivalry between Suleta and... I guess Sophie. their names are... Yes, yeah, and Sophie, right? Yeah. Um, Let's see, what else did they have to do? Oh, the, the crew of the ship that um, Miorine brought, which is all the, the basically the members yeah. of the Earth group. Um, and then Nika, uh, her relationship with the bad guys. You know, we don't, we, that's been uncovered by at least one person. So how is she yes. going to deal with that? So these are like a lot of storylines that all had to either move forward a little bit or get resolved or get to the next stage in this episode. Mm -hmm. And they did a lot more than I, I was expecting. So, um, yeah. So that that's a lot yeah, happened. I really, really liked how so many of them, they weren't resolved. Like, like you said, like they moved forward. But there really was just like so much. But it didn't feel overwhelming. No. It felt like this is the proper time for this to happen. Like I can see how that happened right now with what everything, with what's going on. So, just amazing, and also the Gundam Wing reference, just absolutely. There was so much beautiful. Like it's crazy. It was so beautiful. I was th th this was the episode, and even I just like the the Saku the space flight Sakuga, especially last the episode for last where like was Sophia Homegirl like went out into space and they were doing like the the twirl and sh I'm just it was so it was visually great it was musically great oh my god for at one moment so when she took out the the but not the buster cannon but you know like the 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 weapon the yep. weapon it is a, it's a buster something whatever yeah, it's it a is buster something because he even says like out. this is not a weapon for like co combat this is yeah. like a siege weapon from some kind <laughs> melting niggas like yeah yes. like no so when she did that the music that was playing when she was heading out and like first going against Sophie and stuff, in my head I'm like, this sounds so much like Sawano. Like it can't be Sawano. Like he's nowhere. He didn't touch this show. 
Like he didn't touch this show. So what's going on? And it's it's like someone else is with uh, Takashi Omama. And I'm like, what? Like who? Then I went and I'm looking at his shit. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, okay. Like good, good shit. Like good shit. When they have uh, like the woman in the background. Whoa, yeah. Oh, you knew shit was getting real. I was like, oh, so this is about to go down. Like you knew somebody's was about getting to get real. iced. Like someone's about to get iced. Someone's like, they fuck. It was so. It came together so well. It was so yeah. satisfying and it was so entertaining. Just oh my god, just to see her just do that, and then I don't even think she killed anyone when she used it. No, it was more so like a warning shot or some shit like that. Yeah, she didn't yeah. actually kill anyone. So when we get to the after credit scene, she got to talk about that after credit well, scene, don't so, we? Um. I did like the fact that um, Miorina's dad didn't die outright. Yes. I also liked how she basically was just like, you're not about to die, nigga. Like, what are you doing? That the, you're, you're not about to do this. And then he starts the mumbling of like, me and your mother had an agreement. And, the, yeah, like, and she's like, shut up, nigga. Like, you're not dying. And you're not about to like trauma dump all this bullshit on me at the last second. We're, we're going to say, I'm going to save your ass. Like, we're going to make this work. And uh, I liked that because uh, it was kind of a switch up in a way. Um, because as opposed to... Now, the moment that Shadik betrayed um, Gwell's dad, I was like, that nigga's dead. Yeah, now, but you kind of got the feeling him. that was... When he, we knew that he had betrayed him for real, for real in the previous episode where Shadik, uh, where the other girls questioned like, Oh, you told him that the attack was happening now. You're just launching it immediately. Yeah. And he just looks at her like, you know what this is. <laughs> yeah. Which you know also, we didn't even get that much out that nigga this episode. All we got was no. a look. He was still smiling. Mm-hmm. He was still smiling through to the end. So now I just, I don't see him as the end game. No. I no, see no, him no. as a pawn who thinks he's more than a pawn. But I don't see him as the end game. Like at all. It depends on I'm... what the threads of the connections between all the characters really turn out to be. So one of the, one of the themes I think we've talked about over the course of the season is the way in which this show positions all of the next generation against their the wishes of their parents. Um, that's like the you know not so subtle uh, allegory that's happening is you know the literally youth in revolt and trying to create a different world. So Shadik is currently the prime mover of yeah. the storyline because it's his ambition to kind of pull the trigger on this sort of revolution and cause a bunch of chaos, presumably in order to further whatever plan that he has that has gotten us to this point. But he was not the prime mover prior to like episode seven or eight. You know, it's not like yeah. he was manipulating things to happen in a certain way. He was just observing shit. He was just yeah. observing. He was kind of out of it. And then, uh, and re- really, it was Miorine who was the mover. So, ironically, it's still the relationship between her and Shadik that is the core of all the activity that happens. You know, the dramatic stuff that's happening in the series. And everybody else is kind of caught in the wake of whatever that is. You know, because first it was Suleta getting caught up in all of the games for being the holder at school and then forming the company and f- battling over what is a Gundam and the people want to take the thing. But that's all. That was Mirene. Mirene pushed all that. Yeah. Because she wanted out. She wanted to escape. Ironically, she by deciding that she was going to fight from the inside instead of run away to Earth, she reversed her uh, relationship with her dad because up to the point that they formed the company, her father is the wall that she's trying to get over to get to whatever it is that she wants. Yeah. And then once he becomes a stakeholder in the company, you can kind of tell, like, she never hated her dad. She loved her dad. She hated the bullshit that he had put oh, her through pulling. and all the yeah. rules. You know, that's yeah. what she fucking hated. And you and also so- saw their relationship growing in that, like, scene where they were talking about, like, the details with the company. And mm-hmm. he was sort of teaching her certain things, which was also in a way a death flag for me where mm-hmm. I saw it as, oh, you guys are getting close. This nigga's definitely dying now because of all the animosity that you had in the beginning. But the way that they kept saying, he, Plant Quetta, he's dying. We got it. It's planned. This, this, this. 
it was too in in the in our faces for me to be like, yeah, I thought you were dead, but now, mm, not quite sure it's gonna be you. And that is purposeful writing because you want to leave out red herrings for the audience that are still important to move the action the story forward. So, for example, I, you know, whether he lives or dies at this point kind of doesn't matter because mm-hmm. he's been taken out of the uh, story as a as an actor. He's, you know, they're going to stick him in a pod and me and Rene will look at him and be like, you know, I have conflicted feelings about my father because I hate this guy, but whatever. But then, you know, that's great because setting her up as the heir of Rembrandt corporate whatever all that shit the princess of the series yeah it's very important that they do that because she is going to be the leader of one faction yeah so she's gotta so you have to you have the audience has to kind of be tricked into absorbing you know how realistic that might be in the context of the story so if you see her dad starting to teach her you see their relationship starting to change even if you cut it off right here like you either kill him or you or you literally uh uh, ice box them. Um, doesn't really matter because the point has been pushed across in the story. Now it's about you know Miorine's conflicting feelings about stepping up into that leadership role, potentially of a organization she didn't even want. Yeah. Um, in the first place, so that's one side of it. The other side, kind of, is referenced in uh, Gel's story with his father. Which is, he actually did what me, Rene, always kind of said she was going to do, which was dip. He has got yeah. the fuck out of there. He was like, eh, I ain't, I ain't doing this shit. And we see that it comes back in this incredibly tragic way where he kills his own dad, which which I thought was great. That's that's a great A Gundam storyline right there. Isn't that you know? similar to um, Zeta in a way? Like the beginning of Zeta almost? So in the beginning of Zeta, Camille gets his his mother killed. Yeah, that he is gets true. the mom killed. It's uh yeah, but it's um uh, But he is oh not God. the one that like purposely did. Yeah, he doesn't yeah, he doesn't yeah, do yeah. he doesn't kill his mother. Yeah. But it is a it is a very common uh Gundam trait to have two people who love each other in some way wind up fighting, they don't realize they're fighting each other, and then one dramatically kills the other in the last minute they realize that it was such and such in the suit. Because that's like a you know well, well, I guess she committed suicide protecting Char, but the, it's like a, that's such a good like that moment of yeah. him like impaling the other guy because they do a good job. They show you um, uh, Gail's dad in a, mo- a sort of a generic mobile suit because he even mm-hmm. calls for it in the episode that he's sort of like, I'm going to show you you're going to use my technology against me. And they just had like a regular regular ass suit out there. And it's not clear until kind of the last moment that when Gull's getting out of there, the suit he's fighting is his father. And then they do the reveal because, like, it, everything goes so quick. You're, like, yeah. you're not supposed to be able to pay Which, attention. I For f- a moment there, I actually thought, like, something might actually happen to Gwell. Because, right. like, when he was crying and, like, freaking the fuck out, I'm thinking, wow, are they... Is this just gonna be a tragic character right here? Like they really just got off this nigga. This is like one of the bleakest characters they've had. Like damn, but they didn't do it. No, but I, I telegraphed that the moment was about him getting over his barrier of having to fight because it was a fucked up situation that he found himself in. He's yeah, in a mobile yeah, yeah. suit. It's been tagged as an enemy. He's actually escaping, but he's forced into life or death combat. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He's he's like evading and doing it, but you know that it's going to come down to him having to decide to save his own life to grow as a character or change as a character right there. And that's exactly what happens. And then they hit, hit they hit him and the audience with the ultimate tragedy which is like his growth literally came at the expense of the life of his dad and so now he's gonna have to carry that and how that character rationalizes what happened does that mean that for example he doesn't he doesn't know anything he doesn't know who was behind the attack he, nothing Why and it's not there? as if th- yeah. this situation was actually set up for this to happen to him it was just an accident that occurred in the melee of battle so does that mean that he's gonna find out and blame Shadiq? Does it mean that maybe he never knows how or why it happened and he winds up on the other side? He finds out at a, a pivotal moment. And right. Blah, 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 or he blames yeah. somebody for it that had nothing to do with it. 
so there's a lot of things you can do with it with that mo- that moment but that character had to go through a change so the change that he went through was what we saw and it was a very gundam kind of moment so i thought that was fucking awesome um and i think we we talked about a couple of the other subplots like um you know nana especially saving everybody on the ship with the morse code uh, with the signal yeah. light but then getting caught and so does that mean she's got to kill that nigga? Like, what What do you, What are we going to do Now, that's the question. Yeah, like, is it a secret that she, like, can't let other people know? Or is she going to basically be honest and ask for help with it and basically say, hey, um, I got caught up in this. Like, I don't even really fuck with these niggas. But I think Can she does. I, th- I think that, um, you know, they, they, again, we didn't actually get a ton of exposition on the earth witches and sort of what organization they represent but very clearly the there were two purposes being served by this whole attack purpose a was shadiq basically setting off a war in space in order to create chaos which is clearly going to get you know he's going to make use of that to make whatever moves he's trying to move right yeah but it's also clear that the earth characters have been preparing for war as well and we know that from the very from like the second episode where we saw the protests and everything else on earth that there's a large number of people down there that want weapons and want to fight against the people in space which again very gundam storyline to follow earth versus space so definitely they're being represented as mercenaries right now but that's your revolutionary army and one of them already has a uh a rivalry even though it's kind of one-sided, with Suleta. So whatever happens, either they wind up somehow on the same side temporarily or not. Because, by the way, that I felt a lot of Gundam Unicorn uh, references, even the Unicorn oh. itself. Unicorn itself is actually just a bunch of fan service for UC Gundam. UC but people, like, yeah. But, like, you know, the the... Whether it was like the wing with the cannon, unicorn with like the the bit system forming like a shield, and some of the the look on the of the backpack of the new upgraded aerial, like all that. There's all these like little oh, callbacks. Yeah, like was that like Exia or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. but what the fun thing is that like you know in unicorn, a big part of that story um, is Banager winding up on on the Zeon side. For a little bit because he's captured and then he learns a lot about like you know what the zeon remnant are doing and that which culminates in the um is it is it jabro attack or not whatever they, there's a big attack on the base that everybody remembers torrington base um and so that segment is a another sort of trope from gundam where like you have your good guys and then the main character winds up having to fight alongside or be around the bad guys for a little bit and, and humanizes them a lot. And then ultimately, you know, they have the duel and everybody dies. But, like, I could see that happening as well. But I think we're talking in the circles around it because there's one moment, the post credits, that had people jumping. And yeah. what, it, yeah. what the... F- were you expecting that? Or rather, how long into that scene before you expected that to happen? I expected her to kill him. Yep. But the uh, the part that and I actually someone translated the um the voice actresses for Suleta and Mia Rene. They did an interview. Mm. Um, I think this past weekend or something, or like right after the episode aired or some shit like that. Um, the part that was the fucked up part was Suleta's attitude getting out of Ariel. Ooh, 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 ooh. Hey, oh. oh no. Like, it was so, the juxtaposition of literally just, like, not even murdering someone. Like, literally destroy, just, like, squashing the nigga to the point where his blood is floating in the air. And it's, like, it's splashing on Mia Rene. It's the And also, this is a key point because this is the first time that Mia Rene and Suleta has killed someone. Has, Mia Rene has seen someone die in front of her mm-hmm. that we know of. And uh, Suleta killing someone. And then also it was her, her first time seeing Suleta kill someone. So uh, it's just kind of, it was so creepy and like just off-putting. But that was perfect because it, it provides 
the like catalyst for a schism. It was it, that that's just what it is. That's just what it is. It it was it was a great way to fucking end it. And now I'm like, how are we gonna start this second season? Because apparently this is this next core is they're calling it the second season. So oh, whatever, sure. Fine. I'm like, I don't know. I was like, that's not enough for me. I was like, Iron Blooded Orphans and all this other shit got like forty plus episodes, like Cue this shit up. Like, let's go two more cores. Like, give us a whole four core treatment. Like, if this is what y'all are going to be doing, then, like, let's keep it moving. After the second season, let's do a time skip and let's get even crazier. <laughs> let's get even crazier. Like, let's do it. But with that, like, ending it, I, the, I'm so, I'm like, I'm, in, I'm so just anxious for how are they going to pick this shit back up? Where are we going to be? Are we going to be right there? Or are we going to pick it up where Suleta and Mia Rene are like just opposites? Or is is Rembrandt going to go into hiding or some shit like that? All of this shit like coupled with that ending part is just so, it's so amazing. But yeah, it was extremely creepy. And the voice actors for Suleta, they, um, she said that the directors, they were like, have fun with this. Make it funny. And she was like, what? What you mean, make it funny? And they were like, make it like, act like you're playing around. Play around with it. And so she was just like, oh, this is supposed to be off-putting. Like, this is supposed to be like, what the fuck, girl? Why are you like giggling and like acting goofy right now? You just, you literally just obliterated a nigga. And you fell in his blood. So the setup for this scene was Mia Rene escorting the body of her father Um, most of the enemy forces have either been defeated, captured, whatever. We're basically told over the radio that like the whole operation's a failure. Um, and she's sort of pushing his, uh, his, his wounded body along. And then all of a sudden, um, a remaining mercenary kind of pops out the cut. And I thought it was interesting with that, that, you know, unnamed character where he's basically, you know, talking like, oh, this is like a, like some revolutionary shit. Cause he's. He's like, if I can't, if I can't get out of here, I'm taking this motherfucker with me, yeah, you know, yeah, for, yeah. for Earth or whatever. And Mirina actually makes an attempt to, you know, protect her father with her own life, which is very interesting because, you know, up until now, the closest that they've ever been has been in the last episode or two or the last episode where he's injured. So yeah. this is a very different sort of um, relationship than we're used to. But of course... You know, she's just a child. She's unarmed. And just as a guy's about to pull the trigger, Suleta busts through the wall like Kool-Aid man style and turns that nigga into Kool-Aid by giving him the palm of God. It's, I think it's the first time since like Victory Gundam I've seen somebody, a sub, like a, a non-mobile uh, suit bound individual smashed by a, gu- a piece of a Gundam. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen that particular death. And it they play that up for all the horror because you get to see the hand coming down the horrible noise the uh arm. the arm discon- disconnected the the hand is smashed into the ground there's blood pooling around the hand of the gundam which is very symbolic because in the next scene when Soleta comes like spilling out of the gundam oh 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 oh, oh, oh hey how you yeah. doing me Rita? i'm here <laughs> yeah. and then she r- raises her own arm and she is covered in blood and her hand is covered in blood yeah right the palm in particular and she's like blood spattered everywhere else mirene is staring in horror so let us like i'm here to help you and she raises that bloody hand which now mirrors the gundam's hand which is covered in blood as well and mirene's only word that she gets out is murderer which is sort of like fuck what the fuck you talking about you about to die that's not that's not murder (laughs) that's uh, that's defense so, so Mia Rene is actually incorrect in this situation. Yes. She's being a little baby about this. Uh, and now, and Suleta is this inhuman monster that she's portrayed that way. She's acted that way, which is the culmination of the conversation that her mother had with her, where she twists the, you know, if you take one step, you know, take yeah, one step, you, you gain run, one. Gain you run, you gain one. one. You take a step, you gain two. Yeah. But her mother twists that ideology to explain why it's okay to to kill people, which in a sense, she, her mother was also correct. But you could just tell that this was uh, a part of what her mother wanted Suleta to become. Somebody yeah. who is completely unaffected 
by the monstrous amount of damage that she can do. And again, I'm going to double down. I think that Suleta ain't a person. No. Well, I saw some people shopping around the thought that the um, run, take one step, um, stay, take two is like a trigger phrase or some shit like that for like brainwashing. I thought that was pretty valuable. I don't know it if I could really be. buy it. I, I don't. Um, I think that Suleta is just like really simple. Like she's if, really if, simple. If they were, if the intent was to get that across to the audience, that that expression is a control phrase mm-hmm. for Suleta, I would have a couple of problems with it story-wise just based on the things that already happened. So the first issue I'd have with that theory is that... Um, it is very clear that Suleta understands the philosophy behind that statement and uses it proactively early in the series and acknowledges that her mother taught her that particular yeah. phrase. Second, other characters are who are around have started to believe in that particular phrase, you know, as a as a positive motivator, and any one of them could say it. So the idea that that's like a control phrase, kind of. This is kind of undermines the point. You really wouldn't want your your a uh, golem out there telling people exactly how to brainwash it and tell it what to do. And in yeah, fact, yeah, she's yeah. the one who brings it up in the fight with uh, Guel, um, yeah, of her own volition. Third thing is that normally, if you're telling that kind of a story where the main character is not in control of their own actions, that is done in order to lessen the uh, moral or ethical responsibility that that character has for what they did and there are plenty of um stories in and anime plot lines that revolve around that in fact we're going to talk about one a little bit later in trigun um where that is literally an integral part of who vash stampede is that an event happened where he was not able to someone else was controlling his body and caused him to do something horrible and he's kind of lived with that that trauma for his entire life. I do not think that is what's happening with Suleta because there would be no, there's no point in trying to make her out to be a, just a, a weapon. You're supposed to follow along with her in, in her like philosophical journey. And this whole thing about that phrase is very important because the first time the audience is introduced to it, it's in one context. Now we're at the end of the first, block of the story and we've seen that phrase now used to justify something that we would disagree or hopefully we would disagree with but it's not control it's just she was convinced she believed her mom so she did what she had to do and uh so i i I don't i don't buy that that she's brainwashed and i think that's a way for members of the audience who don't want to deal with the complication of what has happened in the story may be spinning for themselves to get out of, you know, holding anything negative alongside this particular character that they like. Whereas like, I love it because it's twisted, but it's twisted in a way that was, um, we, 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 we were intro to it before. So this is a payoff of a prior story beat or at least a partial payoff. So I like, I want to see where that goes. Okay. Anything else from the episode that stood out? Um, animation was great. We got some cool mobile suit designs. I thought the action choreography was excellent. I think in um, a lot of these non-mainline, like a UC Gundam series, sometimes you can get wrapped up in just wanting to show the cool stuff, but you kind of lose track of where the fuck everything is happening, which mm-hmm. is hard to do in space because there's no landmarks visually yeah. to like center you, the viewers. The scene I, where like... the sisters were fighting together was really nice. Yeah, you know, it was excellent. And I think that um, whoever directed those particular episodes understood the visual language of Gundam in a way that it, I could have watched that same scene. Like, this could have been, you know, Char's Counterattack, like the movie, because there was just a lot of um, good understanding of how to present space combat with giant robots. Um, so I really appreciate that. And other than that little bit, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to 
the tech because they tried to use the antidote system here that we'd already been shown about yeah. shown of and, we and got it an didn't work and sophie said it Zuleta. only works up to what level three yeah or something like that which is like yeah. okay now i want to know more about this permit score and what is it really because we've seen a bunch of machines use it but there and hasn't really Prospera been an explanation suleta went to permit six Yes. Yeah. And apparently that's what kills you. But why? I don't know. But also, Suleta didn't have any side effects. Well, wait. Sule- do, did Suleta go to six or did Ari go to six? Oh. Oh, boy. Interesting question. Well. We don't. Mm, that, that is a good question. Yeah. When I she mean, says my daughter, sometimes was, Prosper uses that, that term in con, inconsistently. In right. Her. Yeah. Right. Or Ariel or Suleta. And sometimes it's hard to tell what she means. And if there is a difference between that, uh, well, anyway. Anyway. Yeah, who knows? Think, yeah. That, 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 um, that theory might be coming true. We, we oh, shall goodness. see. Yeah, we shall yes, see. Indeed. Okay, so high card is next. So how did you like it? I really, really enjoyed this episode, and I think I'm going to really enjoy this series. Mm-hmm. So high card is a, um, I, I'm going to call it shonen, but it kind of falls into that uh, gang of thieves. Yeah, you know, sort of storytelling. So there's. So the, I want to break down the episode a teeny bit to just see what you felt about the, sh- the whole structure. Because we open not with our main character, but with an island that's getting assaulted. We mm. are instantly shown that there are powers and abilities that are are not straightforward. Somebody summoning missiles, someone else can make explosives, like actual, like, I don't even say like comically obvious explosives with timers on them yeah, appear yeah, anywhere. Yeah. We also are shown very clearly that there's consequences because lots of people are dying, like getting their heads blown off, shot in the back. Back to back to back. Ba- yeah. Back to back. We're shown that there's a mystery around these cards because the, the group that was coming in to, I uh, guess, steal them has instead spread them all over the world. Someone named Lala is mentioned uh, that is like a yeah. voice from the heavens. There's mysterious, shadowy people everywhere. And that's in like the first two minutes. And I and this is like my whole thing about first episodes. You have to show the audience exactly why they're going to tune in every week as quickly as possible. What when is the girl hook? made that bomb in the, yes. the helicopter, I was like... I will keep going just for exactly because you're I like whoa what the fuck that. is that that's yeah. super cool that's weird right like I, yeah. I I don't know what to make of this but so you get all that that's like only about like three three to five minutes yeah. so we get so we like we were introed into the world all of a sudden things are wild then they smash they literally smash cut. From that into the city of Spada, which is sort of like vaguely European, vaguely American, mid-century, but they've got like, you know, so they've got like classic looking cars, but then they've got cell phones and the internet and everything else. Now we're hit, we're getting hit with the actual soundtrack, which is very jazzy, very urban jazz, a little bit of electric. We meet Finn, who's our main character, who is like the sly thief archetype. He's blonde, he's young, he's hip. He's, you know, really good at what he does. he's really good at what he's slick. He's also like, you know, kind of a loser, but like a lovable loser kind of Orphan. thing. Orphan. So everything he's a pup, he's like the puppy dog that you really want to, that's really endearing to you because, you know, it, it's the, uh, uh, you know, cyberpunk kind of did the same thing. Right, mm, where you, you hit you yeah, with a, a main yeah, character yeah. who's a lovable loser, kind of like a ne'er do well, but he's got a heart of gold, and they just hit every beat on the head, and they make sure that when you meet Finn, he's doing something cool. What is he doing? He's scoping out a spot to rob, do some petty robbery, and you know he uses the dog as a distraction, so you figure out he's very smart. He's physically slick. He's also a nice guy because he like brings the kid dog a lolly, the yeah. dog back, and one of the lollipops that he stole. So right away you're like okay this guy is endearing i'm cool with him he's clearly gonna get up to some something some mess is happening we find out that the orphanage is running out of money okay motivation character motivation he's stealing but he's stealing money 
Exactly. This, he's he's not good at anything else. All he, he's good at being a thief. The kids there are cute. So now they've hit you with all the puppy stuff. Oh, look at these puppies. The main character's a puppy. All the little orphans are puppies. You know, like, you, you're supposed to connect with them. Then they hit you with the comedy. Because you get to the fence, and he's like, bro, I don't buy stolen objects. And then he, he reads him, and he's like, this is fake. This is some bullshit. He tries to sell the shirt off his back. The guy says, take that shit out of here. I don't want nothing to do with that. So we are set up. We've seen it. Everything that you would want to see in a, to introduce this world and this character, and it's all fun. And then we get the casino because he is like down on his luck. He's like, yeah. bro, get I, I, whatever if it there's takes. There's a place to cheat and win. Right. Casino. And we've already established that this is a card themed. Yeah casino themed show so we get right to the casino and it's like you know big vegas lights but like from like the 60s like very 60s vegas inspired it's all bright and everything else and he gets in there and he's winning at poker because he's he's good he said i've never been a casino i'm just good at this shit and then he gets uh uh run down by a guy who has incredible luck and now we're getting into the magic. Now we're getting into the the, yeah. the mystery. And this guy's hitting and hitting. And it, we know. We already know. The audience knows there's magic in this world. Finn doesn't know that. He just knows he's getting rolled. And that allows him to get tied up with this person as the p- folks at the casino zero in on him. And that's when I think what was a, very, a good episode, just good, solid episode, went from good to great. Because when Finn is in that back room and we are suddenly introduced to like insane characters with yeah. insane abilities weird fucking shit a guy who can, marbles. can turn you into parts of your body into marbles and he's like firing them like bullets they kill the dude so cool. right so with the cool. who's got like the 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 super luck ability and yeah. they actually find a way to do some good exposition to teach you a little bit of what the fuck this shit is because they tell you like oh here's how his powers work you know, uh, you see here's a- someone equipping the card. Exactly. You you're you're visually taught like what now if I see a power use, they have a cool glove that has like the you know the uh, the suit uh, and the yeah. of the card on it and whatever else. We learn that like these apparently are known. These cards have abilities that are known about. And then the cool thing I like how like the guy's luck ability. He's like, oh, I can't die. Right? So people try to kill him and like comically they die themselves in horrible ways. But then the other dude is like, well, you can't die, but I can fucking murder your whole family and I can do all this other shit. And when the guy takes the glove off to give the card to the, the bad dude, he gets all the negative luck. Yeah. Right? Yeah, when he like tripped on the he marble trips, and then he got trips shot. on a marble and falls onto a gun. Oh my God. I was like, that, that actually, I had a question about that too because I was just like, is that because he lost the glove and this was like the buildup of all maybe of that? which I could mean, be we don't know how the power system works right so, so they like, kind of leave that they kind of leave that out there but even if it if it wasn't it's a fun little miniature story because all of mm-hmm. his cheating he used to think came back to him and he died but it also served another function which was to set up the situation where finn who is a thief We've already been shown that in the episode. Uses his powers as a thief, just a re- not magic, just like he's good at stealing shit to steal the card and get the fuck out of there. Okay, so that that's a payoff. That's an act. If, if if this whole Makes series sense. was one episode, you got a setup and you got a payoff so far for almost everything that they've done. Then you get like a fun car chase. Where, like, you know, he robs the guy of his keys as he's, like, running out of the casino. Marble dudes after him. The guy who's there to attack the marble guy. Who also is now a cool character we've been introduced to. Wearing the, wearing the red jacket, you know. Because oh, he yeah, seems yeah, to be able yeah. to go toe-to-toe with this ability, you know. And he's probably an ability user himself. They do the fight. Cars get blown up. Then you get the final showdown where Finn pulls out the card that he's had his whole life that he knows nothing about. He says, fuck it, I'll try. He summons the thing, gets the gun. Not clear what the gun is, not clear what the ability is, but the other dude knew what it was. Kind of like blows half his arm off, and then the other guy steps out of the fire like, I wasn't dead yet, nigga! And you kind of, if you watch the opening, you kind of know that like, this is one of the people that Finn is probably going going to be be working with. And so that's going to be his way. So, so... I only ran down the whole episode because, to me, front to back, that is the perfect first episode of a show. The whole thing could be ass. The story could be absolute trash. You know, 
three episodes deep, I'll be like, I never want to see you see this shit again. But like other series, just take fucking notes. You don't have to like draw a bunch of shit out. You want to show us every all the cool things I'm gonna keep coming back for. Give me that in the first fifteen minutes, and then give me a longer term mystery and a story to like stick my flag into to come yeah. back. Because now Which I want to know there is there because of what yeah. we got at the very beginning of the episode. Exactly. So. If it wasn't clear, I am so impressed um, by the way this first episode of High Card came together. And that's not even talking about the visuals um, and the mood. Because yeah. I got a real Persona vibe out of I this I really episode. liked the visuals. Like, a lot, a lot. Like, and it wasn't, like, super duper, like, fine-tuned or anything like that. But I just thought the overall aesthetic was really cool. I like how they used the shadows on everyone to like accentuate the colors and things like it's been, or like accentuate the angles and things like that. Like even though it was like flat and 2D and I like the CG. The CG yeah. cars, they look great. It was fine. It was totally yeah. fine. It looked great. So like o- overall the aesthetic, I really enjoyed that. And I really like the character design. Whoever the fuck was that that got on the phone and was like a symbol high card, I was like, he's fine as fuck. I was like, who is that? I was like, <laughs> his voice actor too. Right, I forgot like, about that guy. Yeah. I yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. bring him back. Bring him back. Let's go. Is he is he the is he the like uh, the what's what the what the fuck do they call it? The dude that gives everyone the missions, whatever. Oh, like whatever. the if you're talking the about like handler. Charlie's Angels, like Bosley, or yeah, like, like Bosley, some oh, shit. The, like but that. the handler, but right, yeah. some kind of handler character. Those yeah. are great. I hope he's the handler because I'm like, yo, he looks cool. But then I also, even from the very beginning, I was like, I want to see what that sniper rifle can do because I yo, know that's right, the sniper rifle. Nah, we didn't get to see though because they shit. called him off. Yeah, yeah, I was like, we were about to see some crazy shit, and then all of a sudden the wind came and spread the cards out. I was like, okay, we. We have potential. So I think that the show is going to start small. And mm-hmm. then once those people that were in that castle and that island come into it, it's going to take it up a notch. Like, a lot. I also am really looking forward to the other people's um, powers. Because it looked yes. like some dude had, like, or like what is it? Like, plant power? Yeah, you see like that in the that. opening. Yeah, he's able to. Yeah. And but I there's also, rules to it. Who knows? There, there have Yeah. But then I also was actually kind of surprised because homeboy, when he got out the car and he was like all mangled and shit, yep. and he was just talking. I'm like, are they going to kill this nigga off? Because like, he really is just like, just going, I'm like, yeah, you are yeah. like free money. And then he gets a headshot with the marble. Yes. And I'm like, oh, okay. Is If it's this kind of show, because at first I'm thinking, oh, he has a lot of design. Like he was designed. You could tell, character. you could tell, core cast design yeah. when you see it yeah <laughs> he, like, and he had that written all over him <laughs> yeah i was like you're supposed to be a regular yeah and your ass got popped already and then he shows back up and i'm like oh okay that must be your your because he called it like calorie something or other which i'm guessing yeah. if he like he, like he can regenerate as long as he's got calories in his bloodstream or something yeah, about you know yeah, like yeah 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 but he also seems to be able to fight hand to hand because he was going he was going toe to toe with someone you're not supposed to be boy, touching. Yeah, he was giving homeboy like the works and not getting hurt. Yeah, I think the only thing that got ha- that happened was his tie. Right. So yeah, but also the marble power was so when they first previewed him with like yeah, the he's blood like eating, uh, yeah. and he's just like eating and I'm like what the f- where the fuck did the marbles come from like what is this and then you see it in action and he starts like. The first thing where he like goes on the shelves and turn the shelves into mm-hmm. marbles and just like shoots them shits. I'm like, okay, I like this is really this is great. Like this is great. It's not like a nigga who's just like I'm strong, nigga. Let's fight. Yeah. It's like no, it's a power and he's good with the power and he's it's using inventive. It. You, it's, you have it's to learn playful. how to fight him. Yeah, it's and it's playful. also kind of it's also a little bit goofy. But when you see people getting mulched. Like, physically destroyed, mangled, limbs coming off, body parts getting blown away, people getting shot in the head. You, yeah. Because there's a consequence, now you want to figure out, well, how the fuck does this work? What are the rules? You know what I mean? And so that's always a hallmark. Because like he was doing that shit nonstop with the marbles. Right, exactly. Yeah. And even, like, simple abilities don't necessarily have to be presented in a simple way. And that's one of the things I'm liking already about this show, is that on multiple occasions we've seen... Abilities that should be straightforward, like I can summon a bomb, but then like I didn't think that it would be used in the way that we visually saw it happen. And I'm yeah. guessing that if it's like you know 
I don't want to say quite monster of the week, but if like you know they join an agency and he's hunting a down card these cards, a week. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, means yeah. that you get exposed to a lot of different weird abilities attached to goofball, crazy, insane characters, and that's always fun to bounce off of, even when like the core plot may not actually be all that complex. It may okay ro- be a that, relatively though. straight straightforward thing. So I love that. I thought the music was fantastic vibe setting everything was like a vibe check like the whole episode i wouldn't say any one track really stood out as like my god but i remember like the the what was the music that was playing when they were escaping the casino felt like this is they're gonna play this when they're doing some crazy scheme or scam or whatever else and i enjoy finn thinking on his feet and like you know making quick choices to get the fuck out of places or get away from something and he's kind of our window because we don't know anything about the world so as he learns we're gonna learn and yeah so i just overall was a big fan of the way this was introduced yeah and hopefully it's tight hopefully we can get to some resolution by the end of this season it's original isn't it it is an original so like whatever it is as long as there's a clear beginning middle and end like I'm I'm along. I'm they got me. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then so what did you think of the beasts of ours? So I I that also. Yeah, so I had a couple of notes, but the uh basic story and you can tell me if I'm missing something is that it feels like there are pairs of there's a paladin, paladin and like a uh a priestess or a cleric yeah, or something. I don't know what word you use. Maiden or something. Yeah. Maiden. Yeah. And they are able to combine their abilities such that the paladin gets super powerful and can fight these giant beasts. Yes. And the world has been ravaged by these beasts. There's like a imperial faction, but there seem to be other like smaller nations. And there's a a war that will happen, a civil war that's about to go down um, inside this nation. And we're introduced to Kumi who doesn't have a name for most of the first episode, but she is like, they call her an experiment. They call her number 23. Yes. Um, And she's revealed later in the episode to be one of these like magical priestesses. Um, And then we're also introduced to Jiro, which is a, he's a hunter or at least a guy who makes his living as a hunter, but it's revealed by the end of the episode that he was a former paladin Paladin. and something horrible happened to, Either the priestess he was with, or his wife, or someone Somebody, very... Some woman, yeah. But he has, like, PTSD. But in this world, it's, like, magical PTSD. Because he called it something. He was, like, when he was having the memories, he saw oh, Kumi... Oh, the curse of the dead? Some, some, yeah, or oh, something. Cur- so, curse of bereavement. There we go. Which is, like, it's, like, literally, that's magical PTSD. Yeah. Um, But he, at first, in the early part of the episode, he meets this girl, but doesn't think anything of it and kind of actually sells her down the river Sin, yeah, Sin, he's like hey, whatever, i don't give a fuck but then i liked how so that took place on the boat that his or his his ship and in the end of the episode they're back on the docks same area only yeah. this time he decides to save her she's cornered by the imperials who want to like capture her and take her back so in so in the in this story it seems like there are something's going on with these beasts is driving them crazy and it's going to be Jiro and Kumi and maybe that like cat uh trader the cat person merchant. The information cat merchant, merchant yeah that knows whoever cuz she gives Kumi this ring which is clearly important cuz it like attaches to her yeah. and like gives you like the legend like oh this person does go save the world a higher technological level than a majority of Oh well, yeah what well, 100% it should mention that it's like this it's also a very like it's not high fantasy it's sort of the steam a little steampunky yeah you know yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um but it's mostly like low fantasy stuff swords and shields and spears but the imperial soldiers have like uh have guns, guns. of some kind they might be like steam powered guns or something but i wanted to like shout out the aesthetic of this because when i was looking at it it felt like classic shit but like it classic- felt like some adult swim yeah, and it felt it felt like I'm gonna call this like modern classic because I'm older now. So like when I was in my teens and twenties, classic was 80s and 90s anime. That's what it was because that was the stuff that was popular kind of before I was even aware of what anime was. Yeah. Now we've gone forward in time, you know, twenty odd years, and this show's look harkened back to stuff from the 2000s. But specifically, I got Studio Ghibli vibes 
Like a little bit of Nausicaa, a little bit of um, oh yeah, okay, yeah, you know, like some that. other stuff. But then I also was getting, and I don't I know if you remember, like the, we we talked about this show on the on, before, but Zammed the Lost Memories, mm. which is a Studio Bones um, transforming Mecca show, but it had that same color palette, which is all like pastels and like the way people were dressing, kind of had that like native low fantasy kind of look to it. Um, and I could throw, there's some other sort of um, representations. Actually, one thing that I really thought of was um, Madhouse did a Final Fantasy movie in the 90s called um, The Legend of the Crystals. Mm-hmm. And if you go back and you watch Legend of the Crystals, there's so much like vis- visual influences from like the architecture and other things in it. I actually went back and just started watching the movie. Because I was like, it's been 20 plus years since I watched this movie. And as an aside, I didn't realize that in the dub, the person who's playing the main character, Pretz, is Tenchi Misaki's voice actor. Oh! It, it's well, Michael, you know uh, Michael Kermit Williams. Not really surprising, because those they, they, they were used everywhere. But he was great. I, you know what's yeah, funny? Yeah, he, he was good. He, he, he good. didn't really do he's... a lot of other main roles. He he was all oh, he over the it? Tenchi series. He was in Tenchi Universe. Yeah, like he did a lot of those dubs. But like outside of that, it's a lot of like supporting voice work in like you know b- bigger series, but nothing you would specifically remember as being that guy. So between oh. Tenchi and that Final Fantasy movie, that's about all he ever really did as like a leading voice actor. But his voice is so iconic so when i started watching the movie i'm like i swear to god i know this va i know this va i'm like it's it's fucking tenchi but anyway (laughs) um the visual style that they go for is um a little bit unsettling when you see like the beasts and monsters that are out there yeah Honestly, um, it kind of reminds me now that you were talking about like early two thousand stuff. It gives me Aureka Seven vibes. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, the landscape and the yeah. scale of everything, and like the the trees and the fauna. You're totally one hundred percent correct about that. Yeah. Um, and a little bit of Evangelion too, and like when mm, you, that yeah. last monster that comes in in the first episode that has no head, it's just got like the glowing neck. Yeah. And it's, it's like creepily human, but it's not like Attack on Titan grotesque weird proportions it's yeah, just something yeah, yeah, yeah. that large shouldn't have fingernails and like you know whatever like the the pig thing was completely like okay i can see that being a monster but the headless one was definitely and wasn't that the same monster from the beginning of the episode that yes. they were having problems with yeah yeah um wow. and i also think that there are you can always tell and this is also another original series but you can also you can always tell when a good deal of effort was put into world building that isn't explicitly a, a part or necessary for the story to be told. So like the the little pig little the big pig monster it was like breathing out of holes that were in its body. It was like kind of effervescing yeah. powers out of that. And it, like its you, stomach was like heated or something. Yes, like and that. you could see that there were like other functional things just in like background shots or like when they're in the market. Like a lot of thought was put into like what is this what is living in whatever this world is? What is it like? And how do the people kind of exist within it? And that's why I got like the kind of Studio Ghibli vibes because that was, a, I think, a hallmark of those late 90s, early 2000s Ghibli movies is that they could do these big crowd shots of, like, weird-looking people in, like, strange oh, new places, but it all okay. felt... It all feels very lived in. It's not... Um, there's this there's this concept in cinema of, like, what exists outside the camera. So, like, the camera is the only view that you and I are ever going to have into this world, but you can have worlds that feel like nothing exists outside of what you see and then there's worlds that feel like if only they expanded the shot a little bit more i would see so much more cool stuff you know that would th- because i can expect it now because i've seen like you know what was, there was something super unnecessary that they did there was like a, a when they were in the the shop um so kumi is like running around in the city mm-hmm. and she gets she runs into a an older woman who like you know it's like hey little girl what are you doing but actually like takes care of her and brings her into, like, the, the shop that she has. And, like, the clothes that are just hanging up that you only kind of see out of the corner of your eye look, like, super drab. But then Kumi comes out in, like, this, like, cute outfit for a young girl. And the woman's talking about, like, well, back when, back when I was getting around, like, I was also kind of a looker and whatever. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, then she yeah. goes outside and I notice that, like, the 
hood of the thing that she was wearing was the same kind of hood that someone in the earlier shot was attached to their clothes and was like walking away. And I'm like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to make a style and then have the style uh, hold true even with your like unique clothing that you're yeah. drawing just for your main character. That's extra fucking work. And whereas you could just make everyone like have the same clothing and the same you know just reuse everything but Barbie like again, enough in the background and not even be noticeable yeah right um what did you feel about the one kind of fight that we got which was jiro really saving that guy so the speed he yeah i actually thought that was pretty interesting um and it shows that well actually so i can't really say that it shows that because we don't know that much about the show yeah. so like at i was going to say oh it shows you know like everyone has some sort of like minimum physical ability but jiro was a paladin so yes. we don't know like if he went through some kind of special training or for him to be able to resonate with the maiden priest or mm-hmm. whatever if something happened like so there he's definitely different from everyone else but from what we saw with that nigga just running down he the, ran the, down the wall the i was wall, like oh we getting this and then the camera was like this as he came down i'm like uh is this a glimpse into the future because i like that i like yeah that, that looks sick like and it, and it didn't need to be a drawn out like, oh, he's dodging and oh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Boom, boom. He They did the thing. You know, he, he they showed him hitting the pedal, going up, done. Action yep. sequence, over. It did what it needed to do. Basically, it was kind of like an, an appetizer. You know, a little yeah. appetite. It was like, this is, we're, we're not there yet. But when we get there, you can look forward to this. So, and they showed you in the very beginning, too, what a fully... Yeah. Empowered power oh could yeah, I do. forgot about Homeboy with the oh man, I loved how his like blade was like slightly curved. Yeah. I love that shit. Man. It looks so good. But um Oh wow. So damn. Yeah. Oh wait, well that now that's making me think about like I thought that nigga like sliced the monster in half. Oh right, but maybe guess- but maybe it was the same kind. Oh, okay, yeah, maybe it's the same someone couldn't finish it or something. Or we don't really know what these monsters are anyway. Like they could Yeah. That's why I wrote in my notes like evangelion with like a question mark like are they really are all these things really monsters or well there's definitely some kind of experimentation going on yes and then so the crystals that the crazy dude i don't know what he was i don't know what the fuck that was i don't know what that was but he was eating it it didn't look like a medicine it looked like the crystals because when he ate it i was like paying attention to the color and then Mm -hmm. when they pan to the when they go to the seed with like the little mini merchant one of those crystals was almost the exact same color as the oh. stuff that he was eating. So I'm thinking, is he eating some the, monster shit? The stuff that the monsters are eating, uh. and if so, why? Because didn't also, they say, why are the monsters eating? It? Didn't they say that like when the cat merchant was explaining to Kumi like kind of how the world works, and she's like, oh yeah, everything we get all the stuff out of the monsters, yeah. that we hunt. So I'm like, that is very and very the possible. The empire takes the stuff first and then everyone yep. else gets what's left over and the the what's gonna call it the gems are usually what's left over yeah so, so that's super interesting i mean i i feel they did a really good job laying the ground the baseline of everything because as soon as he said the empire takes all the good stuff i'm wondering what is the good stuff what is the empire taking because it doesn't seem like you all know what they're taking right it, it just seems that like oh yeah the empire because it's on their land they get the they get they take like you know some of the best stuff or the best stuff in the monsters and then you know we do these things and we sell it and things like that so right i already with the empire home girl trying to talk to the emperor i'm like we'll see you down the line girl yes like yeah yeah you, you'll you won't join today is this 12 or 24 it can't i mean if they try to there's so much world building i don't want it to be a 12 episode or i kind of want to live in this space that they've created i I really enjoyed that like it actually surprised me because i had skipped it initially yeah it's a 12er um well maybe they'll just get to get to the good stuff then yeah i mean homegirl she's not on the promotional material but that doesn't mean she can't join the party but she gives all the signs of oh i'm disillusioned with the empire and i'm going to eventually betray after fighting the main party a few times yeah Got exactly it. yeah cool like i i get it but everything else so far just it was really cool i like how um the homegirl power went crazy and turned niggas into literal like ashes yo that also oh was fucking God. crazy i was like wait I'm a like, minute hold on 
And I was wondering, I was like, is this because of the ring? Because she wasn't doing it earlier. No, but she was like, the black shit came out of her. She was like, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> they started turning to salt piles. And and very bibli- really very cool. biblical reference there. <laughs> oh, you. Cool. And then the, she looked so cool when, like, the power was, like, just, like, coming off of her skin. Right. And shit like that. And it was, like, blue and, like, orange at the same time. I was... It and Jiro was like, he's like, how are you out here with no paladin? What is going on here? Like he turned yeah. into he turned into stern dad mode, which is what I was the last thing I was gonna say is I think I just gravitated to the story because I like father characters. Yeah, I like I also that dynamic. Really liked how when they first met each other on his boat, it wasn't like a oh he's hot, oh she's hot, oh no, I'm nervous. I was actually happy that there's no sexual attraction at no, all. No, it was like it was like if anything, it was like it was playful like, and you? get the fuck out of here. Yeah, like who the fuck are you? <laughs> okay, I'm drunk. Yep. Dude. See ya. Oh man, Bye. I'm out of booze. Like, there's a lot of comedy. Even I, you know, I realized now that you mentioned about. I forgot that the the Imperial soldiers got turned into salt, which is a horrible death. And we've actually seen some potentially horrifying things that can happen to you in this world if things like if a mistake happens. Yeah. But uh, I actually appreciate that they're doing something that again I have not seen for like 20 years, which is the balance between actual like comedy gags that are embedded into very serious situations that aren't like deliberately over the top like we talk we we talk about back arrow back arrow is like this funny ass weird series everything is played to a 10 so the jokes are a 10 the action is a 10 the drama is a 10 everything is a 10 but like those older ovas especially a lot of the stuff that was like the 80s and early mostly the early 90s they would have these like really serious worlds and i go back to ghibli and like um mononoke hime and other things but when there were moments that were just like ironic comedy visual comedy you know black comedy dark comedy you needed these like kind of goofy characters and that's what the imperial soldiers kind of are they have these weird pig-like you know helmets on very like world war ii inspired they carry big goofy guns they're always bumbling around they they're very inept at everything you never really get the sense of like they're a threat i was surprised that they recognized her on the street right well right yeah i was like they up to that point they were completely useless remember the, the scene in the beginning where she's escaping the building and she literally just takes one out with a door and she her she's like sorry and gotta go kitchen. yeah she, and then you see like, the cook's comically running with the soldiers like get back here nah, nah, nah. it's like very <laughs> it's very like i was trying to figure out like what tone are we going for because even in the beginning that first fight the soldiers the imperial soldiers who tried to shoot the arrow at the monster it comically kind of just got flung out of its body and they got fucked up and then the paladins come in so those characters are low-key kind of there for like visual humor they're not necessarily there to be threatening they're kind of like goofy uh uh they're goons they're literal goons but the the other imperial the commander is scary as fuck this is a crazy psychopathic looking person who does human experiments so his he's like mustache twirling evil but like the psych psychotic kind the imperial people we met in the actual like one scene in, in the capital are all creepy sort of like you know ethereal not quite human you know, evil people. So it's this cool dichotomy where we're going to have enemies who are legitimately fun, goofy, Mm -hmm. scary, serious, dangerous, and we already seen the consequences. You can die. You can die a horrible death if you fuck some shit up. So, like, I I like what I'm seeing. And it's weird. It's very weird. Everything about it is weird. And I like weird. So. Yeah. Cool. I enjoyed that one also. Um... What's something else you you like so, maybe that I did not oh, see? Um, I watched Reborn to Master the Blade. Damn. Um, <laughs> the long ass title, blah, 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 blah. So initially, I actually was pretty pleased with like the intro sequence because it wasn't a, oh no, like I'm this amazing swordsman and then I met my match and now I'm reborn. And then it I died and now I got breasts. Yeah. No, it literally was um, a king who received the goddess's blessing that brought peace to the world, had killed, like, demons, demon kings, all kinds of stuff like that, you know, and, you know, did his job, and the goddess, like, met with him, and she was just like, you know, what is one wish that you would like before you pass on? He said, Mm -hmm. I would like 
to be reincarnated to live my life on my own terms. So as opposed to having to be, you know, the king of the world and being the sign of peace and things like that, he just wanted to basically just be reborn and just live, you know, a regular life. Um, so she grants him the wish, but she grants him the wish in the far flung future. So it's not the same kingdom that he, or as we know right now. So gets reborn, realizes he's a girl, or they realize that they're a girl. So they're a girl. And uh, honestly, it was pretty funny. Um, but in addition to it being pretty funny, the um, world building was actually pretty good because the moment that he comes back into the world, he goes into ether and how ether is different from mana and how mm. how come. And also he's like, I don't feel the goddesses presence anymore, nor do I feel any of the other gods presences anymore. So mm. he, he's already setting up like little things that are definitely going to be expounded upon. But these are just like first observations. So, you know, they come up there, girl, and the whole the half the episode, they're a baby that has like this inner monologue of an old man. And That's a very Mushoku Tensei opening. It is. And it did a Mushoku Tensei because the, they literally get, a, they go over the aunt's house and they the, apparently there are these things in the world now called Magicite Beasts, which are like monsters that have condensed magic. But he also noticed that the majority of humans do not have magic. And apparently for you to be able to use magic, you have to be granted a crest. So... His his um c- older cousin who's eight years old just got his crest, and mm. apparently, and so magic beasts are attacking. It's such a this is such a Mushoku Tensei. <laughs> so and so like this was a determining point for me to basically be like, or is this gonna get dark? Like, what are we gonna do? Because right on cue, a magicite beast literally bursts into the house, and it's like it's only the the two mothers, mm-hmm. um, his two cousins, and the the girl. So what happens is the mom immediately is just like, fuck this shit, I'm fighting. Like, let's go. Like, she literally, like, pushes the nephews out the way. She's like, I'm going to fight. And so he's, like, you know, looking at the mom's sword. She's like, oh, the women are actually, like, trained pretty well. Like, this is cool. But then the mom's sword apparently doesn't work because you have to be able to fight magicite beasts. You have to be able to use magic or, like, you have to have one crest. So the person who could, the only person who could actually fight the magicite beast was the eight-year-old. There you go. I like that. That makes logical sense. Yeah. Within their, yeah. Eight-year-old gets washed immediately. <laughs> immediately. So then uh, he, as a baby, is like, damn. Okay, I'm brand new here, but like, I can't let these people die. So he literally like crawls out. And then, like, <laughs> as the dragon is literally about to like bite the baby as a whole, the baby just like yells and like unleashes like a concentrated blast of ether. Oh damn! And destroy cool. destroys the Magicite beast and like and like the entire half of like their house. And so yeah. I'm like, okay. So I, that's a remix of like the second episode of a Yeah. So I'm nice. like, okay. Nice. I'm, okay. Okay. I'm not bad at that. No. So then they we go for it. We do a time skip. And there's like comedy like strewn throughout it where they're like looking in the mirror and they're like, bitch, I look good. Like, I'm so cute. I got reincarnated as a girl. Like, I got reincarnated as a cute girl. I'm I'm gonna have I'm gonna be hot when I get older. Shit like Damn. that. And then and then cute people walking in being like, You really like that mirror, don't you? And they're like, Oh no, wait, no, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not gonna see that. Um, anyways. Episode goes on, and the final part of the episode is uh, the main character showing off where this group of merchants come to, like, spar with the knights. Mm-hmm. And their families are, like, part of, like, the holy knights that protect the city and shit like that. And merchants, which makes absolute sense, the merchants actually train with knights because the merchants have to travel, like, the lands where the magicite beasts are plentiful. So they have to know how to fight, especially the magicite beasts. Comes to find out, um, one of the merchant's son, like, appears, like, super meek and mild, and then he starts beating everyone out of nowhere. And so, of course, the MC's, like, looking, and he's like, oh, I forgot. None of you guys actually have, like, a feel for magic, so you don't see what he's doing. So the merchant's son is actually using a magic to, like, subdue people and make their, like, reaction slow. Um, but he's the only one that can see it. And the merchant's son is actually cocky and being an asshole and things like that. So the older cousin who was eight, and he's like 16 or whatever now, 
He goes against them and he says, hey, don't look him in the eye. That's how, he doesn't say that's how the magic activates, but he's just like, try fighting him and not look him in the eye. This nigga fights him, doesn't look him in the eye, starts winning and then runs head first into a fucking wall. Damn. So I'm like, wow, are we gonna, is this where we're gonna end the episode? Nope. MC's just like, hey, fight me. And he's like, I'm not fighting a little girl. And she's like, <laughs> I will. She's like, I'll air your shit out. I'll tell everybody what the fuck you're doing right I'll air your shit out right now. And he's like, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'll fight you. I'll fight you. I'll fight you. Embarrasses the shit out of him. And then everyone's like, oh, shit. And the, the dad is like, it's a fucking prodigy. Oh, my God. I got a prodigy. I got a prodigy. And that's where the episode is where everyone's like celebrating. Overall, super simple, straightforward, does not take itself way too seriously. I enjoyed it. I really, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It wasn't one of those, you are in charge of saving the world and it's only you and you have to save the goddess and stuff like that. It's like, no, they noticed the goddess is missing and, you know, they they still have the hero blessing, but also they got reincarnated because they wanted to just live the life at their own whim, not basically be like, oh, I'm going to like rule the world one day because I'm so powerful and so much more smarter than everyone else. No, you're just going to go through life however they're going to go. So... Really enjoyed it. No, that's really cool. Um, I like that they are again cribbing notes from good series. Sounds yeah. like, and I, and I think the des- the character design is actually not that bad either. The, that's why I was like, I was almost there, but I think in my heart, I want all those like reincarnated as a as a girl stories to be Tanya the Evil. <laughs> like that's oh, what I want. It's yeah. nothing to do with what this show is trying to do or any show. I yeah, think like yeah, I'm yeah. still stuck on that as like my archetype i just want to see more of so i don't want to i don't want to hold that against what could otherwise be a fun show yeah and i think that's what it is i think it's meant to be a fun show i don't think it's meant to be the sleeper hit of the season that's gonna mm-hmm. you know have everyone reeling and being like what's coming next no it's just, it's gonna it's just gonna be fun i i think it's gonna be fun so, that's cool yeah that's um, what i liked what about you what else did you watch um, so I watched Trigun Stampede, which I want to say publicly because I mentioned on the show before that I was a, I was a little bit wrong. I thought that this was a, an original story, uh-huh. but it's a, it's really more the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood treatment for Trigun because it actually starts, oh. um, it's, it, it starts a lot, not a lot, somewhat earlier in the story, um, than the original series does and is in, it includes oh i thought this a, was like a reboot continuation so it's really more of well at least from episode one because episode one takes place prior to vash um meeting anyone from bernadelli and millie's not even in the story yet um oh so it's okay. not it is so it if in the sense that it's more is it like a pure, prequel it, no, no, it's actually just more closely aligned with the manga. Because um, oh, there's Trigun okay. and there's Trigun Maximum. And, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Maximum is like the second half of the uh, the original anime adaptation from 98. Um, is Maximum covers like... Well, okay, so I think we're at the point where like Trigun is not a... Uh, it's a known quantity. We're not spoiling anything. We can just talk about the whole series because if you wanted to see it you could have watched it for 20 years so try get the story of vash the stampede who uh runs around a planet it's very it's like wild west i think it's called like it's literally called like gun smoke or something like it's got like and uh it's it's desolate and the people have to survive um using power from the things called plants which are very mysterious for the first half of the series, and then you find out later on that plants are actually, like, they, they are uh, a power source derived from sort of living creatures, these, like, extra-dimensional uh, beings, which are called plants. Um, that's where all the power is coming from. And so you kind of recontextualize a lot of stuff that you see as Vash was going from town to town. Also... Vash is not a human, which is what you find out midway through the series, that he mm-hmm. he is actually a humanoid living plant, and his brother, Knives, and he both came out of the reactor of the ships that were bringing all of the colonists to the this new planet. And so they kind of pop out of nowhere, and then they're raised by 
um, a female engineer who's like on the uh, on the ship, and obviously they don't know anything about the world. They know nothing about humans, and they age very rapidly to you know from like a a baby to like a a young kid in like one year. But mm-hmm. when they're on the ship, and they actually, and this is what I'm saying this because they cover quite a bit of this in the first episode. Um, they find out that they weren't the first humanoid plants to come out of this reactor, that there was one that came before both of them named Tesla. So you got Vash, you have knives, and then Tesla was the one who came before them. But when she came out, uh, the people on the ship used her for experiments. And so the result, and when they, they they both discover this, Vash actually tries to commit suicide. Um, knives is develops a hatred for humanity and you know the female engineer who raised raise him rem basically talks vash out of or or stops him from killing himself and then knives decides to kill all the humans and so that's why the colony ships all blow up and crash and why the plants who are on the other ships survive because knives is the one who causes that to happen and so the opening okay. is like uh knives basically of this the the opening of this episode is the last half of knives and vash on the seeds colony ship watching rem die and then knives admitting to vash that he ki- he killed everybody or or he blew he blew up all these ships and they're all crashing and it's all his fault um you know and then you just cut to the desert and the story kicks off. So I was wrong in thinking that it was a original series or something that sort of takes place after, um, you know, the story for a couple of reasons. One of the big ones is that uh, you actually get a tease for Wolfwood in episode one because um, you see something go by with like his signature cross or the the, the coffins with the cross on it and everything else. Mm-hmm. But the the whole first story uh is takes place in a in a new town, at least from the the very first episode of the ninety eight anime. And I'll just kinda I'll leave it there for a minute. So that is the setup is all of the really weird space sci fi fantasy stuff that you don't learn until halfway through the original anime. Um, We start with that. So that's really cool because it reminds you that Trigun actually is a high fantasy or rather uh, a high, high science, science fiction series. But you don't remember it that way because that's not how it's really presented to you in the, the older one. You don't have all these like giant spaceships and like great looking tech and robots and whatever. All you get is the dilapidated rundown Western shit that, you know the, the way the world has gotten to like after the fall um so i thought that was a really great way to just recontextualize the whole series for old fans and new fans because at the end of the day you're getting a retelling of the same story but maybe with a little bit more uh of like the bits that were left out so i really enjoyed it i enjoyed the look of it i think the cgi I was questioning it at first, but having watched the first episode, it is fucking fantastic. It is so good. It is good enough that for this series, and maybe even for some of the like late 90s uh, properties that you know are going to get remade, because if Trigun is getting a remake, Kenshin is getting a remake, or at least a continuation. Mm. Where's Cowboy oh, yeah, Bebop? Yeah, 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 that is. Where's, where's Cowboy Bebop? Ooh. They tried it with the live action, live action, and it didn't go over well. But though it made some money, um, I think that I wouldn't be opposed to seeing a Cowboy Bebop remake, just straight up in the style. Yeah, obviously adapted for the more noir. I want kind Outlaw of, Star. Outlaw really Star would be it. fucking perfect. Like, I mean, let's let's keep it real. Great nowadays, that yeah, yeah, no, sick. no, you're one hundred percent correct. Like. Outlaw Star would be perfect. I I don't know who I have to kidnap in order to convince some studio executive to like just 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 take a chance. Just take the chance. Outlaw Star would be such a fucking breath of fresh air if they did it right now because it's yes. it's like it's the it's not underground because every you know if you had Adult Swim like you were cool but like yeah it was I think just that would as be good as everything else. It was right. just as good. 
Yeah. Honestly, I liked it a little bit more. I don't know. I just I like that cast. Actually, no, not more. I just I like all of them. But like, it's I as I just on, vibe with Gene Starwind more than I vibe with Vash. Yeah. Vash is once you kind of figure out what he's about, he's very kind of like he's playful, but he's like a distant character. He's he he's deliberately like not really somebody who really shares a lot about what's really going on. You know, yeah. like you, even to the us, the audience who's watching the show, it's not until much later that you kind of realize, you know, his angst and like where his life philosophy comes from and like what he sees in the world versus what everybody else sees. Because his whole thing of like wanting to promote love and peace doesn't it doesn't fully make sense until you find out all the backstory with him, Knives and Rem and like the July incident where basically Dives is able to control his uh because they're both plants he's able to uh activate the special cells in vash's body that can create anything and in this case it creates a giant fucking super laser and like blows up a town and kills two hundred thousand people so like that backstory is why he has committed himself to like the opposite of what knives is about knives is about annihilating the human race because they're evil so it's pure destruction and vash's ideology is love and peace like i won't kill anybody i am against killing and i want people to live and i will do whatever i can to make that happen but again unless you know unless you once you learn about the rest of his backstory vash is a much deeper character to follow than gene starwin because gene starwin is just a young adult trying to make his way in the world but I vibe with Gene Starwood because he's a young adult trying to make his way in the world. Yeah. Like, that's what... That, I have so much more in common with him than I do with Vash. I want Vash to blow people's heads off. He's never going to do that. So, yeah. I would I would love that. Um, Animation-wise, also, I think you... you I, we, we talked about this in previous episodes where CGI is tough because you can do things with a 3D camera... That can either make you very lazy as a director or make it difficult to translate what worked in 2D into that 3D medium. Some directors will cheat and they'll just shoot it like it's a, you know, a, a, a 2D anime, a drawn anime. Mm-hmm. But then they, what you get this weird uncanny valley, even if they have like great you know, uh, filters and post-processing. There's this separation of, like, the character in front of me on the screen, the space that they're occupying, the background, everything else. It just layers in this weird way that you could just... It just doesn't feel right. In Trigun, the camera is, like, a very natural movie camera. It kind of reminded me of even a little bit of Doro Hedoro, where the camera itself is a character you can actually use the character the camera to sell drama to sell comedy to sell anticipation in just in like how you place the camera and seeing how it moves in trigon the camera is there to sell action and comedy so it bounces along with like a a truck where meryl is with uh roberto and they're having a conversation and there's like a pan where like Meryl's on one side and Roberto's like drinking and she's complaining about him drinking and then they hit like a rock and like instead of just having like the car bounce up and down the car bounces and the camera kind of bounces to the car and it kind of bounces over to Roberto who's like day drinking and (laughs) Meryl's like what the fuck are you doing um when you get the reveals of things it will pan up a sand dune to highlight some guys coming over you know some government officials you know coming over the dune riding on you know motorcycles or whatever but it'll be they'll be in in shadow coming over so it's like ominous but then it pans out and they're kind of like you know they're not they're not so threatening. Or when they go into the plant and all the, like the colors change and the camera tracks Vash walking up the steps. Or when he's fighting with the insane um, government commander who fires a fucking rocket. Vash's mouth will comically open and the camera will draw back to show like the rocket firing into the air. And all of that stuff is what you would expect to see in a movie with a director who really knows a lot about CGI. But this is like a TV series. So it kind of has this feeling of quality. That like, wh- the, whoever, whoever's behind this, they know what the fuck they're doing. They know about framing. They know they know about the action. And the animation is very loose and very like cartoony. But not in a way that uh, 
gets it feels it feels like it feels like trigun vast scrambling to grab a bullet the one bullet left is bouncing yeah, on the ground yeah, yeah. and like waving his arms and reaching and his you know he's he's not doing like the full cartoon stretch and squash but it looks like he could do it and that's great it looks fucking fantastic it looks so good um that's so, what i've been hearing from people that they they really like it it does look yeah good. I would just say, give if you're on the fence, maybe you've never seen Trigun before, and you're like, oh no, they're doing a CG. Just watch the first episode; it'll melt into the back of your head within five minutes. You'll like kind of forget that, like, oh yeah, that's right, this is a CGI. You'll just feel like you're watching a show. And then okay. when they when they do something that's like taking advantage of that 3D ness. Um, then you'll be like, oh right, yeah, this is this is good CGI. And I kept having that feeling of like. Oh yeah, this is good. Oh yeah, this is good CGI. All right, this is good. Oh, this is good CGI because my brain is like forgetting to care about that. So, um, yeah. Also, Meryl Strife in is he, Millie's not in this episode yet um, because of how early it takes place. But the way they animate her makes me like that character so much more than I did in the original because she's kind of like. I don't know, like dowdy a little bit. She's always like kind of running around and fucking shit up. And in this yeah. one, like she, they save her, vi- her like body acting through a scene to only when it's the most comedic. So like when Vash is like tied up and they're having a conversation, it's very early in the episode, but like he, he's been captured and left to die. And Millie and Roberto have run out of gas. And so, she's very thirsty and hungry and doesn't know where to go and vash promises to lead them to the town but they don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy so he's tied up and it's like her demeanor goes from like a very guarded to the moment he mentions that there's like a a bar with some food and some drinks and like her eyes go up and she's just like panning you know her arms all over the camera like oh we gotta go this way no no no, we gotta go this way no no no, it's over there like it's it has the same energy for, as like a hand drawn comedic anime from the nineties, but it's okay. CGI and looks great. So well, good. Yep. Now we need some dishonorable mentions. So uh, we we we, the, we watched many shows, but some of us did not sit, sit right with our spirit. So which one uh, yeah. of the new stuff you watch has really gotten to you? Uh, I wouldn't say that it got to me, but it really disappointed me. Um, fuck, where is it? Um, the Sundere Kun, it's not Sundere Kun. What is it? Yeah, Sundere Akuya. Endo and Kobayashi Live, the latest on Sundere Villainess Lisa Lot. Mm-hmm. So, I, the premise, I liked the premise. But the first episode was really just like, meh. To me. Some people might like it. But when I compare that first episode to the other villainess um, anime that have come out recently, it's not on the same level. It's it's not giving, to me, what it needs to be giving for a first up for that. The premise is cute. But also, I feel like it's going to take forever to go anywhere. Because clearly, the guy in the human world has a crush on the girl. And it's... It's just like, dude, you're just doing this shit because she's into these Otome games or whatever. These Not Otome games. But like, well, yeah, yeah, Otome. It's an Otome game. She's mm-hmm. into these Otome games. And so you're going along with it because you have a crush on her. And now, like, the guy can communicate with them back and forth. And they can change the story. The only thing that caught my eye that I was like, oh, maybe I want to come back to this is that they're not the only ones that can influence the story. Because they okay, give a cool. glimpse of someone else who also is like, oh, I can't wait to like talk to you again or something like that. And he looks as though like he's malicious. So it seems as though it's not just going to be them like goofing off. It seems like actual stakes will come into it as far as, oh, we thought that, you know, we made things okay between them, but this is still going down the route where she dies. Why is it still happening? And that guy might be the foil to them to, you know, doing things the way that they think it should go, which things happen pretty quickly. Like, you know, they determined that the girl was a sundere and that like she it, it and that came across to the prince and so the prince started to fall in love with her but 
I don't know. I, I don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to become more involved in some form or fashion. The opening kind of spoiled a lot of it for me, and I can all, I was already guesstimating a lot of it anyways. So it's, it, it was just really disappointing for me. I, I don't know. I don't actually don't even know what I was actually. You know what? I was expecting something on the same level as um, Villainess Final Boss. That's what I was. Mm. I was expecting something that was like snap, snap, snap. Like move, 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 get the point across and like move on to the next arc while also like expounding on all these characters simultaneously. And it really didn't do that. It kind of just opened up. They spent a little too much time in like the regular world as opposed to the game world. And then we got into the game world. I was like, okay, like they didn't, the first interaction between the villainess and the prince in villainess final boss was so palpable and just, wow, I hate that nigga. And in this, it's kind of just like, okay, so that happened. <laughs> so, so what's next? Okay, cute. So it just, it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't do hit. anything. Yeah, it, it didn't hit. It didn't hit. I, I people clearly like it because I think it the rating on the community rating is like seven point seven two. So that's not a bad rating. A lot of stuff sits in the sevens anyways for the majority of the season. So mm. that's not bad. I just don't know if it's for me um yeah. and yeah that that's my that's my disappointment for now i mean i i have a shit ton of more stuff to watch so there might be a completely different one next week where i might come back and be like i absolutely hated this other one actually <laughs> but yeah the, i i had to juggle because there were a couple that i just knew i wasn't gonna be into um yeah. and saying something is like Saying something sucks versus saying to me like I didn't enjoy it versus something is like technically bad is a very hard like line to pull. Like I never want another X arm situation. Like I I'm yeah, saying yeah, I yeah, will yeah. kill myself if I have to be forced to watch anything like that ever again in my life. Like the shock of that episode being as bad as it was, and that series being so inept. I don't think I'll ever find anything as horrible as that. But there were some series that I gave the first episode a chance, and it just, it just, you know, wasn't for me. Um, I, I think the one I have, like, the least notes on is that I gave The Tale of Outcasts a try, only because in one of the trailers I watched, it seemed like it was kind of doing some supernatural shonen battle stuff, you know? Like, there were a bunch of characters throwing swords around and doing things, so I'm like, ah, hey, you know, I'll give it a try. The only thing I could say about this series is that it is clearly made for, I, I don't want to say it's for, for women, but it's very likely for the type of person who would fantasize about having a hot, furry demon as a romance interest that only they can see and interact with. If that, like, you know, a very, oh. like, vi Victorian era sort of, like, okay. you know, suited, beautiful man that could turn into a beautiful animal person werewolf fantasy or something uh, where like right that. if you're if that's your kink and you're into romance stories with a touch of action around that then tale of outcast is for you i am not that person and aside from it just being very boring um it also did not deliver on any of the things i thought could be cool so what is the the basic plot and i don't even remember anybody's name and i don't care there's a little orphan girl who's the ward of the church. She has some special ability where she can see supernatural things that other people can't see. She's essentially being shopped around and abused by the priest who runs the church. They don't, they make it like sort of obvious it's physical abuse, but it's not sexual abuse. But oh, wait, we'll get there. Um, one day, you know, after getting, like, beaten for not being cute enough, begging for change outside for the church, she kind of wakes up and there's a demon in a nice three-piece suit who looks like a, a, he's a, do a doggy boy, and he's just watching her. And she's like, yo, I don't have any friends. You're the only person that I could just talk to. So she just starts unloading all of her shit, irrespective of the fact that this is fucking weird. And so, so after multiple stranger. days 
of this nigga doing nothing and her getting her ass beat <laughs> for no good reason. Finally, he starts talking to her and he's like, yeah, you know, uh, I'm bored. That's why I'm like hanging out with you. Um, I could turn into a human if I want to, but then I'm so beautiful that I can't, I get too much attention. But when I'm in this like demon beast form, nobody can see me. And you know, I'm, I'm like very aloof, but you know, why don't you just keep telling your stories? It's not like I care or anything. And so they form a relationship like that. Then she gets sold. The priest sells her to a sadomasochistic child rapist with a hook for a hand, which is like the most on the nose, evil bad guy thing that you could a write up hook anywhere for a hand it was, yes <laughs> it was it was actually like co- comedic because she so the priest is so desperate for money he just sells this girl into sex murder slavery and then they literally do the thing where he walks out of the house they close the door and then she looks up and just sees all these torture implements on the wall and this nigga's getting like the i'm gonna rape you look that's in like every bad anime where like you know, when niggas put their mind, do some nigga shit. Oh, it's coming. So that's what he, his face did. And somehow she managed to like fight him off and pull his arm off and to reveal that he had a hook for a hand, which is like completely unnecessary. It does not come into play at all, except to just give this character something to make him look even more like lecherous and dangerous. Um, chases her out to the, chases the, the girl gets chased out of the hallway and at that point, the demon shows up to protect her. He's like, you know, I finally decided that I do care about us being friends or whatever the oh fuck it is. Oh my god! But but the catch is that in this world, demons make contracts with people, but they can only make contracts where they take something important from the person. So normally, it's like you sell your soul, you know, in which case you will turn into a horrible monster. But like, you know, you get whatever the thing is that you really the power you always wanted. He refused to, like, do this because he's just, like, a mopey asshole. So he had not... So he, he, he was the one demon who was, like, above the fray on that shit. And she had nothing of value to give him. So it was like, ah, oh, this is kind of a wash. So when he comes back, uh, it turns out that the guy with the hook hand had coincidentally also sold his soul to another demon. And so he decides oh. to protect her, but doesn't have a contract. So he's literally Weaker. falling apart he's yeah. actually just fall- physically his body is shattering because that's the penalty for doing something that is altruistic for a demon to do oh. and then and then at the last minute she says you know i there's one thing i can give you that like you know is my most important thing it's her her eyesight because that's what allowed her to like see and become friends with this guy and she's like i want to see the world with you but if i give you my eyes can you save my life and he's like, fuck, yeah, I guess. So then they make the contract and what? turns out he's turns out he's like actually the most powerful demon ever, but he'd been on like a, a fast for <laughs> for hundreds of years. And then he just whoops the other demon's ass and at and the the B plot of the episode where they, there were these two exorcists who were also affiliated with the church who were going around killing demons that were tracking a demon and yeah. they thought it was the priest because they were getting all this energy from his house that was actually from the first guy. But it turned oh. out that it was because there were all these like murders happening in the city and they were like, oh, it's a demon that did this. So they assumed it was it was a lot of mistaken assumptions. But when they find out that the priest sold the girl into slavery, they beat the shit out of him oh. and then went and ran to the house, which was already burning down from that demon fight. And the furry guy is carrying the little girl away. And that's like the end of the episode. And I'm like watching this. And I'm like, God. There's maybe some kind of a story inside of this that I could be remotely so interested she's in. So blind now? Oh, yeah. Wow. So, but it's it's so fucking melodramatic, and like the animation is like really cheap. You know, like they, yeah, they yeah, yeah. the cool shit I saw in the trailer is clearly like a supercut of the three episodes they spent any money on, and I'm just like, I don't really care about little blind like almost raped girl and demon prince what thing. What is the name I, of this one? It's called uh, Tale of Outcasts. Tale of Outcasts. It sucks. My verdict is nah, son. I'm not watching that shit. Furry demon romance bullshit. Not for oh, me. Oh, okay. This yeah. this girl. Okay. Ew. Not for me. He's not nope, hot. Nope, nope. What the fuck? To her. <laughs> 
furry demon romance shit. I don't I don't know. I want nothing to do with it. It's kind of uh. Yeah, no, this is not <laughs> it. Well, hi, well, he got a gun. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck is going on. It's a okay. lot of ideas. I don't think any of them I, really. Uh, I'm surprised you watched that. I wouldn't have touched that shit. Listen, oh I was goodness. I was half paying attention. I I, I couldn't. <laughs> be- I was like, I cannot believe it. Like, I don't know what this this shit is. Uh, there was some other stuff I watched that was like mid, but this one I think was just bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, definitively not good. Won't won't follow. Don't know why I watched it. Ugh. Um. I, I, uh. I'm hoping Inspector, which I wound up enjoying. You're gonna like, try to do the second season. I don't know if I should try or just wait till the season because I think it would be an absolute nightmare to have watched the first season week to week. I think that would have just been like, uh, yeah. Also, I, I don't know if I could have done this that. One. Yeah. Um, so nice. yeah, I, I did not like it, and it's for somebody else. It is not for me. And that's perfectly okay. Uh, so that's all we'll be doing for this week because there's just too much shit. Like, and no, we we can't do all that in one episode. So we'll be covering other things, I guess, in the next two weeks too, because there's other stuff premiering this week. Mm-hmm. Um, and also like returning things and people people are talking about Vinland Saga. Oh my god, blah, blah, blah. Farmland uh, Saga, yay! Yeah, they're talking about the differences between Wit Studio and Mappa. And I'm like, well, I didn't even finish the first season, so I don't care. Um. But yeah, we'll it's a fantastic week. story. I think a lot of people who are expecting one thing are not going to get what they want, but it's absolutely mm. amazing. The first I watched the first episode. We'll talk about it next week, but the first episode is is all about the psychology of slavery from the point of view of a slave. It's okay. so good. It's so, but it's so because it's white people. Uh, it, no, ah! but it's, it's really really good. Uh, anyone who read the manga knows that like. Whatever hype you had for the first half, this is such a deeper, better story that they're getting into here. With much more emotional, much more about, you know, learning what it means to be a person in this world. And yeah. so if you're ready for that, and you're ready to grow up and learn something, then you'll watch it and enjoy it. If you're like, how come Dolphin didn't kill anybody in the first five episodes? I'm here for murder and murder and blood. Fuck you. Because that's not what this is. This is a this is actual masterpiece writing. And if you don't not here for the prestige shit, then just go somewhere else. Well, they're gonna find out. They gonna um, be mad. I think the only piece of news that I even care about is that um, Troika is having um, um, a Aoki. I probably fucked it up. I don't know. Anyway, the director of Fate Zero, Out of No Zero, and Ray Creators. They have an original anime that they're about to announce at the end of this. Oh, so oh, I'm here for that. I want. I'm ready. Whatever it's gonna be, I'm watching it. Did I'm, Troika also produce Tongue of the Evil? Am I misremembering that? Uh, actually, you might be right. <laughs> I I don't. I I don't know. I let me maybe. see. Tanya, Tanya, Tanya. Oh wait, Saga of Tongue of the Evil key anim. Wait, key anime. Maybe it's nut. Maybe it's N- yeah, N-U-T. I don't know. What else did Troika do that I'm remembering? Uh, Second, they were, no, they weren't key animation. This is I second. swear to God, I've heard I've heard that name in relation to a, a good series. I can't remember. Don't, 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 don't. Anime pro- production, production, production. Whichever one says anime production is what they did. Uh... Don't even worry about it. I'm, I'm just. Uh... I'm going through the list now. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I was just curious what else they had done. Uh, oh, but no, I'm I'm here for it. Give stuff. me, give me more uh, of anything that guy's touched because. Yeah. I'll be damned. I'll be damned if they were getting more original shit this year. Like it is so necessary. And if it's I'm... a mecca, thank you even more. So y'all already got. Aldo and Ray Creators. I mean, Ray Creators wasn't like fully Mecca, but it was no. Mecca and it had a good chunk of Mecca. There's a lot of Mecca in Ray Creators. Yeah. So like, you know, if you, you want to do a little dibble dabble with that too, I'll take it. But whatever it is, thank you so much for doing something else because... Yeah, I'm yeah, with it. it I, I, I have confidence in this team and 
I'm already just thinking, okay, so Sawano is coming back. Maybe, maybe. Actually, I don't even know. That man is so busy and booked. Just, I would, I don't know. He can't, he can't compose for everything. But I feel like if they're gonna do another project similar to Aldo Zero, you gotta have Sawano come back. Like you gotta have, you gotta have the vocal tracks. You gotta have it on on deck. But yeah, we'll see. That's the only news that I care about. Um, the there are two small things, but one is just hilarious to me. So, uh, Tokyo Revengers already has had, um, some, like, live-action shit that's been, you know, put yeah. together before, but they also are getting to new movies. I don't know if you've ever actually watched the live-action for Tokyo Revengers, but it, when you watch the, or see anything from the live-action version, it hammers home how fucking absurd the very concept of the, of the manga and anime are, because these are supposed to be, like, 15-year-old kids, like, 14, 15, Maybe I think, like, Mikey is, like, maybe 16 in the timeline of, Mm -hmm. like, the, of the, of the story, the main timeline, or whatever the early timeline is. Motherfucker. When you see the, the actors that they needed to get to cast this series, it's a fucking joke. All these niggas are, like, 30, okay? And they don't even look like kids. Like, in what universe are any of these motherfuckers high school students? Like, I'm looking at some of the, the, like, even, like, the supporting cast shots, and I'm looking at this shit like, that is a 40-year-old man back there in a wig. These are not, these are not 15-year-olds. Like, what the fuck are you doing? The wigs are going to do the work. It's insane. It's something, it just shows you how stupid, like, when you even look at the manga, like, the shit that happens, you're like, there's no fucking way a 14-year-old is doing any of this shit. (laughs) <laughs> with like tattoos all over their body this nigga looks like he yeah, chain smokes like 80 packs yeah, a day yeah. like i get that like japanese people are short you know but like come on i'm looking at faces not bodies these niggas faces are old all these niggas are old old and the reason why is that if you actually got a bunch of age-appropriate actors to play these roles it would just look ridiculous yeah. Everything would be utterly ridiculous. Like the tattoos. So small. The body yes. frames. Yeah. Right. Like nothing. This shit. Even the guy they got to, to uh, play Takamichi. Like look at the, this motherfucker. This is just like if anyone says go go look at the actor who, who's playing him in the live action. Like this shit is absurd. Ain't no way. That is a grown ass man. He looks like uh, the wrestler Kazukuchi Okada who is like in his... He's like in his thirties, his mid thirties. That's not a fourteen year old. It is not. Oh boy. So that's one thing. It's weird and annoying. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I cannot wait for the slam dunk movie to make it over here. I a cannot slam dunk wait. Movie. Yes, it's been out for about a month and a half in Japan. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. This does so. not look like a teenager. Oh my god! I mean, them niggas that, that don't make no sense. But are you, are you talking about the? <laughs> are you talking about the Tokyo 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 Avengers? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. <sighs> That's what? kind of also a similar problem with like a lot of sports anime, except for the fact that at least in the United States, I've I've watched plenty of high school sports. And I'll be honest with you. There are places where some niggas look like they are middle-aged men. Oh, no. You know what? Be... I've been seeing that. A lot of these, like, 18, 19-year-olds, Yo. they look like they're in their 30s already. I saw a 15-year-old a year old. that was playing high... I think he was uh, playing for some, like, um, high school basketball team in uh, California. Bro, if you had told me that this guy was a clean 29, that he was, all, he was like, <laughs> a fucking G League veteran... You know, like someone who's been in that system <laughs> for ten years, I would have been like, "Okay, you got me," because he had a this this fifteen fifteen had a full fucking mustache, and he's probably like going on like six five. He's gonna keep growing; he still had a couple more years to grow, so he's probably gonna Ooh. turn out to be like six seven when all said and done. I saw this motherfucker, and I'm like, Is "Let this bad? baby." Oh wait, like, basketball, not football. Yeah, okay, yeah, basketball. Like, ba- okay, yeah. no, no, like this is this child and it is a child looks like a grown ass man like Six straight up foot five at 14 he's 15 years old he is six five. Oh my god it's gonna get to the point where like his joints are gonna start aching and shit 
I mean, the, anyone who gets over seven feet will have that. I think he'll probably only grow another couple inches. Okay. But I mean, I don't know. But still, I oh, saw this wow. kid play. And I, and when you see him from like down the court, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, the, he looks like a basketball player. He's really tall. And that mm-hmm. part sticks out. Then you see this motherfucker up close. And you're like, that ain't no motherfucking mustache. <laughs> Ain't no fucking way. Oh, he has like a baby face, but he's got a of fucking course. mustache. Of course. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> so I'll give it up to like like some sports like anime where they be having these like grown looking niggas <laughs> that are supposed to be in high school. But I'm like, I've actually I've seen that before. But imagine a whole universe where everybody looks like they're thirty, yeah. but they're fifteen. No, 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 no. no. Okay. So I'm looking forward to Slam Dunk coming over because I feel like all these Kurokodo Basque like Zoomers, they don't know what a real basketball anime is like. And apparently this movie is the shit. So I hope they remake that. Give me a, a TV remake of Slam Dunk. Woo! Woo! Of Slam Dunk? Slam Dunk! Yeah, I mean, Takahiko Inoue is still, like, producing, like, manga. He's still writing Vagabond. Like, he's a... Like, Slam Dunk is a kind of uh, franchise that you could very easily, like, update to, like, any time period, as long as they're playing basketball. Oh. So I think it would be fucking sick. Slam Dunk is just one of my favorite uh, uh, ba- uh, sports manga of all time, but... What ifs, what ifs, what ifs. So yeah, that's about it for me. No, oh, okay. Um, then I guess when the what what else is there? Oh yeah, recommendations. Do you have anything you've been reading, watching, playing? It's um, a great question. Uh, not anything new. Um, okay. I did catch up to so I uh, maybe. Two, two or three months ago, I mentioned LAG Lag, which is a manhwa, which is like a death game reincarnator loop type story. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Very, very like uh, grounded and brutal. It's not like you're, you know, pretty boy. I, I revived with all the top max skills and now I'm going to build a harem. Like, yeah, not, it's, it's the not one, one of those. where he keeps going in and like people die in left and right. Things yeah, like it's that. fucking yeah. brutal. All of it, he's all, constantly getting like betrayed, backstabbed. All yeah. of the people that, like, every there's only been, as far as we're maybe like fit, almost 60 chapters deep, and there's been exactly like one character that he met about halfway through that still has not died yet. Everyone else that you thought was going to be like a main supporter character has yeah. been killed off and they get they get killed off in like sometimes horrible like brutal slow ways other times it's like oh he turned his head the wrong way and something just cut somebody's neck or it's oh. just like you know incidental shit uh and it's like well guess that one's gone all right what's what's next so uh yeah so i caught up on that which i had not read for like a month a few months when we talked about it and it was like awesome also i caught up more on peerless dad which uh is like i did i've been ignoring that i've been ignoring that series forever because it's related to red storm Mm -hmm. um which i loved but like when i tried to get into it i just didn't understand the vibe that it was going for because i'm not a big fan of like murim stories the ones that take place in like sort of feudal china-esque worlds uh where it's all about like you know kung fu fighting rather than other stuff i'm just not in, i was not into that but like peerless dad is so good because it's about a, a, a dad so the dad part actually is what got me started and then like the shonen power-up bullshit uh and martial arts is actually what uh has kept me going because a great story so i was i was probably behind by a few months on that one caught up there um and the video game wise i've been playing a ton of vampire survivor which is surprising me because i was like i'm not gonna play a game like a mobile survivor. game it's oh a, i've seen some streamers playing that yeah yeah, yeah. it's a reverse bullet hell game is the best way i can describe it um but it's a lot of it's a it's like a it the guy who made it it was principally coded by one dude and his history is that he came out of like uh mobile slot games 
So he was like an, a designer engineer of like slots. And he's like, I want to make like actual video games. So like you get addicted so quickly because it's got all of the visual dopamine hitting slot machine oh. like aspects to it. But it's not a, you know, it's like an $8 game or $4 game. You just buy it and play it. But like it, it's so cleverly designed in that way. And it's also like a, it's a little procedural and you do like 30 minute runs in this game. And like, once you figure out how it works, it is so addictive to want to keep going back in and going back in and going back in. So played a lot of Vampire Survivor um, in the last week or so and enjoyed it. Cool. Uh, I haven't been playing anything because I've just been editing. God damn it. I mean... um, but... Well, I beat Chained Echoes, and the ending is definitely something. Now I understand why so many people were arguing about the ending. Mm. I, I I I get it now. Um, it's ambiguous. It's 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 something. It's something. oh shit. I, I I liked it. I liked okay. it. I liked it because there's definitely like a little twist at the end where it's like, ooh. What? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> um, it definitely leaves things open for a sequel. Like, absolutely, like, sequel is super possible. And I just, the thing I really enjoyed about the game was finding all the little, like, books and letters on the side talking about the rest of the world. That, like, because you only, your own, the whole game takes on place on Volandis. But there's like a whole other continent that you're like next to. And then there's like a northern continent that mm -hmm. only the shores are accessible. Beyond the shores, no one can access the con the continent for some reason. So, oh. it's, so yeah, there's like they the lore has already is already being established so much where I'm like, you can do another game, you can do a prequel. Like you have a lot to work with with this. I, was I love the character writing in that game. Yeah, the character oh. writing is so strong. Well, you're gonna <clears throat> the ending is gonna be something. Um, cause I I they, it, it 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 tricked my ass. I was like, what? what? <sighs> okay, this is what we doing? Cool, cool, cool. Especially with um the characters themselves. Like everyone gets like a little like send off note on what they're doing after this jump. Mm, cool. So it's not just the, oh, this is only about Glenn and Lynn and these are the only two that can, that matter. It's like, no, everyone, you know what everyone else is going to be that's doing who right I care after. About, though. Huh? <laughs> that's who I care about, though. Who, Glenn? Glenn and Lynn. Lynn yeah. Oh, well, yeah, you're going you gonna to get something. You're going to get right, something. Good. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. There are a lot of twists. I don't even know where you're at right now, but there are a lot of twists, um, especially with like the the chain the meaning of the game and like the chained echo and ugh, let me not say that because that'd be a spoiler but like we yeah. are the chained echoes like meaning and how it relates to that shit great 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 and the pact the pact oh man like there, there's so much potential for the game to keep going Espe like, especially with so much stuff that was said in the epilogue scenes like they were they were dropping shit in the epilogue scenes about oh yeah you didn't finish explaining that or wait where'd you come from or wait weren't you just here and then you were and then wait and then you uh, okay okay cool I'm ready. so another ep another another game great cuz you should do it i mean i think he i think he's going to after how successful this one is i think he's probably going to get like a shit ton of support because didn't the same thing kind of happen to the Stardew Valley guy? Yeah, like, literally. Yeah. Yeah. He did it by himself and then he just got picked. Does he work for a studio or he's, he's independent, but has yeah. like support. Is that what that is? I don't know what it's like for Stardew Valley guy. Cause like I bought Stardew Valley on like every platform. I just never played it like uh, mm. much. It is. It, it was fun. I just can't commit to farming sims like that it's just yeah i've, I've been there before something with about my kids. soul i'm just like i don't i don't know man i need to i need to hack something like i can't i can't keep waiting on these cabbages and shit but, <laughs> waiting on these cabbages yeah that that, uh. that'd be my little like recommendation for the week i'll try to like i've been meaning it to like get caught up 
Well, I was trying to get caught up on Vinland Saga, but that's just not going to fucking happen this season because there's just there's too much stuff that I'm actually interested in that I want to like keep it going, like Ning and Fushin and things like that. But we'll talk oh, about we can, those we can talk about we can week. talk about that one because I also watched it and I have some interesting thoughts. I don't think it's it was bad at all. Yeah, not at all. But um, we can talk about that one and fuck what up? What the fuck else is coming? Oh, the Ars Nova, not Ars Nova, the the apocalypse one with the snow that one's coming oh, out this week. Yeah, the near Automata one came out. I need to watch um, that. Apparently, I've heard good things about from people yeah. who played the I game. I saw so. something about they're doing so, two paths at the same time. I don't know what that means because I never beat the actual game, but I haven't watched the actual anime episode yet. So, yeah, we got a lot to cover. Like yep. we didn't even talk about buddy daddies and all that kind of stuff like that. And we so, we gonna be back with it next time. Yes. So if you haven't already, you know, go ahead. Like, comment down below. Let us know what you thought of the episode. And also let us know what you're watching and whether you enjoyed it or you didn't enjoy it. Um, because pretty much the majority of the things between the two of us we're going to watch. Like, I, I'm watching the romance stuff. I just didn't say much about the romance stuff this week because it's a lot of it. So that'll that'll be covered eventually. But, like, let us know what you thought, especially, you know, if you see it in a short or this or something on YouTube, etc. But you can follow us on Twitter, anime underscore savants. That one is... You'll get the quickest response there because that's where notifications go primarily. And then just regular anime savants on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and your podcast platform of choice. Yep. And you can always hit me up on Twitter at Neural Handshake, all one word. Uh, pay attention to some of these comments, uh, especially on the YouTube side. Some oh, my God. Oh, my God. I completely forgot about that fucking comment. Hey, bruh, chill out. Oh, my God. Chill out. Wow. Yep. You we pay the... attention to the comments. Oh, so... my God. The 2D character. You went crazy. Listen. You we went appreciate the passion. Crazy. Over Rudy. Not, not, not exactly what we were trying to say, but listen. Wow. The passion well, was all there. It's not so... our fault that you have selective hearing. So... You can always go back in the video and check it out. I mean, see you what could, we had to say about it. It's it's understandable. This is your first time like coming across it, but like we literally have a whole episode of us talking about how much we enjoy Mushoku Tensei, including the characters, and also which was said in the clip. Like, bro, like y'all don't like listening. Come on, like comprehension skills. Are you like fourteen or fifteen or sixteen? Like, what are we gonna do here? But. We literally said we are we enjoy the journey, even though we <laughs> recognize that he's still a piece of shit. Because that's what the show is about. It's about his journey. So, yeah. Oh my god, I'm gonna let you know. I didn't read the bleach stuff. I didn't read the bleach stuff. I stopped at the bleach part because I was just like, I don't even want it. After this first part, I don't even want to know was, what you guys say about there bleach. There was, there was. I don't even want to know what more. you guys say about bleach. But it's all good. Like, like I said, appreciate the passion. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you know we 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 could, we could we could listen a little harder and maybe avoid. Such I a wouldn't even recommend like touching the grass. You need to lick the grass, like. But that's just me though. So listen, it's all good. It's all yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> we will catch you next week. All right. Bye. Peace out. <laughs>